That's what, that's what we've been talking about over this last little while. This one named Jesus. We're going to be dealing with yes or no. We're talking about Jesus. And, and this, like I said, this, this series about yes or no, we're going to continue to talk here for the next several weeks. But this was a question that was raised by John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the one who asked this question. As you're going to find it even later on in the message, John was one of the ones who, who testified about Jesus. He didn't do it on his own, but I'll get there in a second. But he's the one who asked this question. We read in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, it says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, the first of where was John? Where was John? Where was he? He was in prison. Do you think he wanted to be in prison? Do you think he expected to be in prison? But he finds himself in prison. He heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus. Oh, you already asked a question, right? Hence the word ask. Are you the Messiah we have been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Again, honestly, he just wants a yes or a no. Are you him or aren't you? You know, should we should we keep on looking? See, like and I, as I shared this in the first message, I'm not going to go really far into this. I believe John can question a few things. But again, you can watch the first message on this to find all that, so I won't get into it today. But in the first message, we, we, we discussed John's questions and what possibility, you know, uh, there could be that him asking this. But then the message after, the, the, the second message we looked at this, we looked at the probability factor of one person fulfilling over 300 prophecies about the Messiah. And we looked at that factor, and if you remember, we looked at, in, in, our, in our message, of just one in eight prophecies being fulfilled. And when you looked at it, this, this is this is verified, a verified study of the one guy who did this. The, the chances of one person in their life and just fulfilling eight of the 300 prophecies in their life, and just eight of the 300, was a 10 to the 17th power. Remember what that is? It's a 10 with 17 zeros behind it. That, that is the probability of them doing that. You have a better chance of winning the lottery. A lot better chance of winning the lottery than you do of just fulfilling eight of these prophecies in your lifetime. And then we even looked it up to where it was um, to fulfill 48 prophecies. And that was 10 to the 157th power. Can you say, wow, that's 10 with 157 zeros behind it. And then I, I laid out to you that statistical impossibility is 10 to the 300, I think it's 10 to the 316th or 17th power. So that would be 10 with 300 some zeros behind it. And I said, I did my own rough calculation on this. To fulfill all 300 prophecies would have been like 10 to the 987th power. That's three times past impossible. Now, I don't want to get too far, but I said that to sort of lead you into what I'm getting ready to say here. And all this was the point of the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, that he is the Christ. And I believe that when we're done this series, you will have a very good understanding, you will have a good knowledge, and you can know for sure, you, you can know beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. And I know the other week when we did that series, we talked the probabilities. If you did not get a chance to get the uh, the messages, I mean the, the, the notes on that, the notes here apparently something's going on somewhere because an alarm's going off. Okay? Uh, but, but if you want those, I have I made another 15 copies of this up here where it gives you the information I gave you about the probability factors, the arguments for, arguments against when you try to say certain things, and also some, some additional information on the back to go on the web and find it. Go to Josh McDowell, go, go, go to Lee Strobel. These, these are guys who did some uh, um, apologetics into defending the faith, defending the Bible, defending who Jesus is. Okay, so, so all of this up there. But I led all that to, to bring you back to, as we were talking about that message, this is gonna, so I'm segueing from that into what we're going to go into today. Do, do you remember when I was asking you the eight questions? You go ahead, it's a, it's a couple of slides, I think it's two slides up. Do you remember the eight questions I asked? Remember, two weeks ago, I went to Cindy. And I, and I, I used Cindy as an example how I narrowed... Send me out by using these eight questions. I narrowed her out from seven and a half billion people on this planet by using these eight questions. By using these, and, and, and anybody can do this. Again, these eight questions will allow you to single out one person out of seven and a half billion. It doesn't matter if our world becomes a place where we have 200 billion people or, or a trillion people. 
you use these eight questions, you can narrow it down to one individual. Hence, can you see the correlation when even when we talk about the probabilities of just eight prophecies being fulfilled, how it began to do so, how eight prophecies, how it was 10 to the 17th power. And, and I said all that says, why did God do this? It's so, see, I was able to point you with these eight questions to give you the exact address to where Cindy Thomas, had, and we would know that was Cindy Thomas, because we even narrowed it down in her household. Because then we asked her her first and middle name, because we know Thomas could be there, so we want to find her. And by the last question, it gets us exactly where we are. But it begins to correlate, so we can find her address by asking these eight questions, narrow her down from the rest of the world. And that's precisely what God did with Jesus. God literally gave us Jesus' address. So we could know beyond a shadow of a doubt who Jesus is. So with this in mind, we've already looked at John's question. We looked at Jesus, what was declared, what was declared about him in prophecy. And today I want to look at what does God have to say about him? What is heaven's testimony or heaven's proclamation about who Jesus is? What do the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the angels tell us about Jesus? Do they tell us yes or no? Is He the One? Is He the Christ? Is He the Messiah? And that's what I look at the Scripture today. So as we go through this, we're going to look at some different things. I have them highlighted in my notes. I don't have them highlighted on the screen, but I will point them out to you as we do this. We're mainly going to be looking at some Scriptures more. I'm not going to try to... Uh, can't commentate too much on this because we wouldn't be here a long time because we got a lot of scripture. Alright? But uh, let's, let's look and see what the Bible declares about this Messiah, about Jesus Christ, and what heaven's testimony is. In Matthew chapter 1, verse, starting with verse 18, a lot of these portions of scripture I'm going to start off with today. You say, Pastor, shouldn't we be preaching these at Christmas time? Well, these are a lot of the accounts that we do use around Christmas time. But they fit our purpose for today if they speak to what, what we're looking at today. And here's what we read. Matthew 1, chapter 18 through 25. Verse 20, I mean, verse, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Here's what we read. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. So even here, Matthew's right at the beginning. Matthew's the primary one, and he's what? The Messiah. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, what was Mary? What was Mary? What does that mean? She never had sex before. Okay? While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant, now listen to this, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So she became pregnant because of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Because again, it's not like today. If Mary would have been found out, if it would have been put out that Mary was pregnant without it being her engagement, because back then engagements were a lot stronger than they were today. They, 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 they were sort of married without being, without uh, taking you to, to, to the intimate act of sex in marriage. It was that strong, basically, because literally was concerned she cheated on him. But, but he was a righteous man. He, he didn't want to bring her up to an open shame. So, so again, if it would have came out of public knowledge that Mary was pregnant, according to the traditions of that day, she would have been killed. She'd have been stoned to death. They sort of look at uh, um, pre-sexual marriage, I mean, pre premarital sex. A whole lot different we do today, don't they? And all that was going according to, to, to the law. But he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, now listen, an angel. What did? An angel. So all of a sudden an angel comes on the scene. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So first off, the angel's putting his nerves to ease. He said, look, Joseph, Mary was not unfaithful. This is the work of the Father. This is the work of God. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. 
and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he is for he will save his people from their sins. Now I'm telling you, if I was sleeping at night time while I was pregnant, an angel appeared to me and says, When your child is born, you're to name him Matthias. I would have named him Matthias instead of Joshua. <laughs> you know? I don't think I would have pushed that issue too much. You know what I'm saying? But the angel spoke to him and literally told him what he was to name Jesus. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive with a child. So in other words, since Moses was raised in Judaism, that's what Moses said. Joseph, since Joseph was raised in Judaism, I just realized it as I said that. Since Joseph was raised in Judaism, he was taught these prophecies about this one who would be the Messiah. This prophecy that Isaiah gave that a virgin is going to conceive. Now again, even if before this time, we don't know what kind of discussion Mary and Joseph had. Mary could have said, Joseph, you know what? I haven't been unfaithful. We, 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 don't, we don't know. She could be telling you, know, Joseph, the, the Lord did this to me. And the reason why I say she could have done it because I'm pretty sure the angel appeared to her first because before she be, well, we'll get there. Well, well, before she came pregnant, the angel told her you're going to be pregnant. And here we find out that she is pregnant and what Joseph now knows. Okay? And I'm sure she could have been pleading her case. So God coming in, he's stepping in. So he sends his angel down. The angel tells him, look, you know, this is of the Lord. He says it's fulfilling prophecy. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God's with us. I can see that. I can just, if, if Joseph could think in his sleep, I can see as the, the song, Joseph's song, that, that the one songwriter wrote is, you know, Lord, how, how can it be? How can I, a simple carpenter from this land, be, be, be the stepfather to the Son of God? How can I, how can Mary be the one who's chosen to do this? I can see all these questions going through his mind, but yet the angel saying, this is the work of the Lord. And in fact, so much it says that when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now listen very carefully. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. Joseph named him Jesus. So here we see, heaven comes on the scene and angel speaks to Joseph and declares what's happening is of God. What's happening is of God. Mary has not been unfaithful to so we see that the angels got involved here. Then we read in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. He appears to Mary. I probably should have read this one first since this is probably how it happened first was that he appeared. It had to be, it happened to him, spoke to Mary first. Well, listen, it says, Do not be afraid, Mary. The angel, see again, the angel told her, For you have found favor with God. I'm going to stop there just one second. How many of you want to find favor with God? Amen. How many want to find favor with God? Now, most of the time we say we want to find favor with God, we always assume that one of these days I will preach a message on this. I, I haven't been released to do it yet. We, every time we think of the favor of God, we always think of everything going smooth. Everybody, like, you know, we got we got the fog, you know, the favor of God. We got the fog around. Here. So, so everybody's going to like me. Everybody's going to love me. My job's going to go great. I'm going to have all the money in the bank that I want to have. All my bills are going to be paid on time. I'm not going to have to worry about this. I'm not going to have to worry about that. Because I have the favor of God on my life. Let's be honest. Isn't that what we think? Let's be honest. Isn't that what we think? He may not do it as handy as I just did or as sarcastic as we did. But if, we, if we're truly honest with ourselves, if we're truly honest with Lord, give me this message sometime soon. Allow me to do it. That's what we would think. Because here, we hear declare to Mary, don't be afraid, Mary. We need to told her, for you have found favor with God. Now listen to me tell her. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you, you, you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And I can sort of say, oh, 
I'm a, wow. God's son is going to come for me. Me and Joseph, uh-huh. I come from the line of David. He comes from, oh. You start to look at things, up a two and two together. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. But then she asks a question. She says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. She's saying, you know, it can't happen because I haven't had sex yet. I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. So all of a sudden now, I'm not going to go too far this day, Mary finds herself again in a very curious situation. Hence what I talked about earlier when I'm talking about Joseph. Want to do it quietly because literally God by placing his favor on Mary now put her in a very tight spot. Because if God's hand would not have been upon her life, she could have very well died of being pregnant and not being married. And she had the favor of God. But again, we'll, we'll get there someday. I just want to put that right here. We see the angel, the angels involved declaring all of this. And then in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, we read this. It says, but the angel, all of a sudden now we have an angel on the scene, reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah. So the angel's declaring before he's born. First of all, he's declaring before he's conceived. He declares after he's conceived. And now he's declaring since he's born, the angel is, the I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. And you will find the baby wrapped snugly in, cloth, in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. It's also now, it was a single angel. Could you imagine being a few of the shepherds being out there? You see this angel telling us, and Nelson. When he's done saying this, all of a sudden, kabam! Here's this heavenly host, the armies of heaven. That had to be a terrifying sight because when we say the armies of heaven, when the word armies used, you imagine someone who's prepared for battle. You know, many times we see the pictures of the heavenly host, and host does mean army. But when we think of that, we just think of all of these guys in white robes with their blonde flowing hair. Am I right? Because aren't those the pictures that we've been given? So that's what we imagine to see all this. But no, man, this, this was a terrifying scene because the armies of heaven were there. And so you have, you have the warriors of heaven, the warriors of heaven, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth with those whom God is pleased. But yet you see, before his birth, his mother's told by an angel. I mean, before he's conceived, his mother's told by an angel. After he's conceived, his stepfather's told, hey, don't worry, this is the plan of God. And then as he's born, the angel appears. And once the message comes out, all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, come, boom, there, there's this massive group behind him declaring and praising God. You want to, Man, if you thought we were praising this morning, I would, I would have loved to have been there on that night. I wouldn't want to be alive at that time, but I just would have been there at that instant on that night and transport me back to the 21st century. I had no desire to live back then. That's a whole other subject for another time. But, 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 but yeah, but, but here, but you have the angel here. And then in Luke chapter 2, we read this too. This is, again, what is heaven's testimony about Jesus? So we see all this. So we see the angel beginning to tell a little bit about who Jesus is, right? About who the Messiah is. To be who, who he is. What to expect. Then in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 32, we read this. It says, and at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit, who did? 
the Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Which means this dude, since God promised him that, he, he knew that if he had to live to be 300 years old, he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Now again, we know he's an older man. I'm sure how old he was. I'm sure he wasn't quite 300. I'm sure he wasn't quite 200. I'm not sure how he was, but again, um, but, but God gave him this promise because he was a man who loved the Lord. He was a righteous man who loved God. He says, you will not die. The Holy Spirit told him, you will not die until you see the Lord's Messiah. And it says, that day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations. He is the glory of your people, Israel. So through the Holy Spirit, Simeon declares that this is who? The Messiah. So we heard what the angel told Mary. We heard what the angel told Joseph. We heard what the angel and the heavenly host declared to the shepherds. And now when they're presenting the baby Jesus on the day when he would be circumcised and he would be dedicated a man of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit declares through Simeon that this is the Son of God. He is the glory of Israel. He's the salvation. He's the one who will save His people. He's the one who would be the light and reveal God. Reveal God in such a way that they never experienced God before. And then in the book of John. The book of John was not in you know, the book of John was not written by John the Baptist. It was written by John the Apostle. Right? But in the book of John, the first chapter of this, verses 32 through 34, it says, Then John testified. Now, the John referred to in this is John the Baptist. This is before he was in prison. Okay? It says, Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. Talking about who? Talking about Jesus. I didn't know he was the one, but, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me. Who told John? God told John. The Holy Spirit told John. The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. God. And then yet we read a little bit later on, hence what we started the message with in Matthew 11, about him asking, are you the one, aren't you? When he's where? In prison. See what you mean? And I, as I told you the first week, it's okay sometimes to have some doubts. God's big enough. What we need to do, we need to ask him. And if we truly ask him with a sincere heart, you know what? We will get an answer. He will reveal himself. So John declares this. But it doesn't stop there. So you see the Holy Spirit involved there. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, going along what we just read in the first chapter of John, it says this is after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the waters, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. Now it doesn't stop there. And then it says in verse 17, And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. So even the Father himself gets in on the act and he declares that after Jesus comes up out of the water that this is my beloved Son. I'm greatly pleased with him. I'm very happy with him. He's my Son. And then you have Matthew chapter 17. A little bit later on in Jesus' life, Jesus now, his ministry is beginning to come to an end. 
He's at the height of his ministry where, where, where the thousands of people are following him everywhere he goes. I mean, just think about it. I, I was, I was, uh, one of them were talking about this the other day. Do you, if people who deny who Jesus is, it sort of, it, it sort of cracks me up. Because here you have a man who covered an area of walking back and forth smaller than the state of Delaware, just up and down. In my note, Delaware's our second, I don't know what I'm saying, but Delaware's a pretty small state. Just traveling around some roads, you know, center, center from Jerusalem, he went no more, no more than 50 miles north and no more than 50 miles south. So basically, in the 50 mile circumference around Jerusalem, that's all he ever went to. He, he didn't make it to Europe. He didn't make it to Asia. He did make it to Africa as a child when, he, when his parents took him away, you know, to run from Herod. But as far as his ministry, as far as some people, he was just there in that area. And yet, he turned the world upside down. He impacted the entire world. For people to say, you know, he's just some dude. I'm telling you, there's got to be something special about him. This he went on. But this guy who traveled no more than that affected the whole world. But God here declares that his son, and then has a little bit of this, like this comes to the end of his ministry. This, this happened what we call the Mount of Transfiguration where he's transfigured for his disciples. And it says in Matthew 17, 5, it says, but even as he spoke, talking about Peter, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. As Peter, you know, he didn't know what to do. He was in fact some situation where, where he's seen this, this wonderful sight in front of him and, and, and you know, Peter was Peter's the type of guy I think if, 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 uh, if it was quiet in the room he'd be the first one to speak because he couldn't imagine just not having something going on so this is going on and he, he just uh oh I, I, somebody needs to say something so he, he says something but God says no 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 listen to him this is what he said the Lord let us then when he, when, he, when he saw Elijah and he saw Moses conversing with Jesus He's let's build three tabernacles for you. And God says, no. He says, it's all others. Even God pointing Peter back to what it's all about who? It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's all about my son. He brings me great joy. He says, listen to him. So we see that truly as even in this part of Je in Jesus' ministry, we see where the angel made proclamations about who he is. We saw where the Holy Ghost through other individuals moving upon them, make proclamations about who Jesus Christ is, declaring that yes, He is the Messiah. And yet alone, when we see Him through His baptism, that God the Father Himself got involved to declare that this is my dearly loved Son. I am greatly pleased with Him. And listen to Him. See, all of heaven has got into the act of declaring who Jesus is mm -hmm. while He was here. It's more than just even about fulfilling the prophecy. Heaven spoke up to again to point us, to, to truly let us know, to give us Jesus' address to, so we can know beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. So I'm going to close with what I closed with the other week. And I had down here and I said, why did God go to all of this trouble? And again, like I said, I believe it's because he wanted Jesus to have all the credentials he needed when he came to this world. Because again, like I said, the probability factor of fulfilling those prophecies about the Messiah, to fulfill all 300, like I said, is three times past impossible. Three times past impossible. And then yet heaven declares who he is, and the angels declare. The Holy Spirit declared it. God the Father declared that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah. And He did all this so we could know, so we could know, and we can sell in our hearts that He truly is the Christ, that He truly is the Messiah. 
But yet, the most exciting thing about Jesus isn't all of this stuff, even though this stuff is neat. The most exciting thing about Jesus Christ is that He came to change lives. All this information I shared with you over these last little while, all the information I've shared with you the entire, entire time I've been here as your pastor, if all you have done is just absorb it in and just soak it in and say, oh, that's neat, that's neat, you know what? It does you no good unless it's changed your life. Unless Jesus, unless you've allowed Jesus to come in and change your life. Knowledge by itself is not enough. You may know I'm getting your 12 bucks on the third food in there, okay? <laughs> You may know how to bake or make a carrot cake. You may have Betty Crocker's recipe book right in front of you. There you go. You have it all there. You have all the ingredients that you need in the refrigerator and in your pantry. You have the baking pan. That, that, that you have, you have, the, you have the, 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 yeah, the cake pan that, that, that's sitting in your cupboard. You have the oven which to turn on. You have the water and the milk and you have it all. But unless you make the cake, unless you put the ingredients together and do it, all those things, all the things you have, do you no good. You still don't have the cake. The same thing it is about me coming week in and week out, looking up this guy, that guy, watching this preacher, that preacher, listening in there. If you never take what they say and receive Christ into your heart and your life, it does you no good. See, the listening isn't enough. It's the action that needs to take place after the listening. Listening, that is the most important. The most exciting thing about Jesus Christ is that He came to change lives. He came to change your life. He alone proved correct the hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that describe His coming. And yet heaven declares who He is. And He alone can fulfill the greatest prophecy of all for those who accepted the promise of a new life. The reason why we can know we can have a new life is because He did fulfill all of these prophecies. The reason why we know we can have this new life is because what the angel, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father declared about this one named Jesus. The reason why we know is he can come in and change your life around is because he proved it by fulfilling the prophecies. And when God said, Am I truly giving his life on the cross for us? And then rising again the third day. We're going to get there in a little bit too. We can know this and we can receive the promise if we'll accept it of a new life. And here's what God declared in the Old Testament. Then I'll jump to the New Testament. It says, Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take, a, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. See again, until you receive Him, until you let Him change your life, until you take all this information that you have and receive Him into your life, you can't receive what I just talked about here. It's when you accept it that this happens. And I'll show that to you in Scripture. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Of which he's given you what? A clean slate, a new life. He said, well, Lord, how can that be? It does, don't you begin to try to rush and try to figure it out. Let God take care of the God stuff. Just trust Him. Just believe it. And then again, Jesus Himself, He reiterates the great love of God. And He says in John 3, 16 through 18, He says, For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him, but anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and His Son. I'm not going to do, I've done a lot of commentary on that. I'm not going to do it today. It just speaks for itself. It tells you 
What happens if you believe? It tells you what happens if you don't believe. But in John 1 12, it says this. But to all who believed him and accepted him. So again, it's not enough to believe. I hear a lot of people say, Well, I believe in Jesus. And and, and I know, 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 I know. People like to say, the Bible says don't judge. I know it says that. It says don't judge unless you be judged. So in other words, if I want to judge somebody, I just need to prepare to be do what? For me to be judged. And it doesn't stop there. It says for the same standard, for the same measure, so the same standard I use to judge someone else is going to be the same standard that's going to be used to me. Okay? And also the Bible, even Jesus himself said. Now I've had Jesus said that there. Jesus himself said, said, you will know people by their fruit, by the life they live, how they react, how what they do, how they live their lives. So it's not enough to believe, even, even, even the Bible says, the devils believe and tremble, the demons believe and tremble, but guess what? They are still demons! But they believe! So these people say, well, I believe. But does your life, do you live that belief in your life? If you don't live that belief, you can say it all you want. You don't believe. But to all who believe him and, what did he add to this? Accepted him. Which means when you accept him, all of a sudden there is something different about your life. And it says, he gave them the right to become the children of God. See, the thing is, when all of a sudden we just lay it all down and I say, Jesus, we're going after you with everything that is in us. All of a sudden, something begins to happen. And we now are now established as children of God. Which means, and when you begin to really think about what that means and what John's declaring, I'm telling you, it should radically chance, transform the way you live your life. Again, I'm not telling you everything you can go easy because, again, we sort of played with the favor of God, didn't we? But I'm here to tell you truly, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No matter what may come your way, he is more than a conqueror who lives within you. And you're more than a conqueror through him. Yea, despite all these things, overwhelming victories is ours through Jesus Christ who loves us. Is he the one? Almost certainly he is. He is the Messiah. He is the one and only Son of God. And he came to offer you the chance of having a completely changed life, to have a radical makeover. To truly turn you into the individual that God has planned for you so long ago. He has plans for you to give you a future and hope. What a wonderful say. But this is what heaven declared about this one day, Jesus. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. At least I'm preaching to most of you here on the choir this morning. <laughs> but we need to know this. We need to encourage this. We need to understand this. So when someone asks, why do you believe this? You can say, hey. Because boom, 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 boom. And, and, and you know, if you don't know, say, hey, I don't know, but I'll find out. I'll talk to somebody. And we'll sit down and talk to you about it. You don't have to have stupid faith. It all still comes down to faith. But you don't have to have stupid, blind faith. Even we so far just step out without seeing the word of We're not stepping out without seeing it. We're stepping out knowing who our God is. That's what you understand. A lot of times you know, I'm just stepping out not understanding. Well, we may step out not understanding, but we can step out knowing who our God is. You hear me? We can step out in faith knowing who our God is. We can know that He fulfills all of His promises. He is faithful to every single thing that He says. We can step out of knowing that, that knowing no matter what, it's not on us, it's on Him. And since He's the all-powerful God of the universe, and since He won't hold, He won't hold any good blessing from those who love Him, who follow Him, we can step out in faith. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and do foolish things. Okay, Pastor, I can say, I'm going to go ahead and buy this million dollar home. I don't God's going to make the need. Well, you're an idiot if you don't have money to pay for it. You do that, you better make sure it's God telling you to do something like that. Well, I'm going to go charge up this charge up. Well, the thing is, see, most of the time when we do that stuff, you notice when I name that stuff, who's the center of that? Is it God or is it you? 
Because the Lord said, I'm going to. No. It's, who's it about? It's about Him. And as long as we keep it about Him, we can do anything about Him. And boom. It'll happen. Because it's not about you. It's about Him. I hope you're enjoying this message. I know, I know we, if you, about every three to four years, I will come back to these because there's, there's a reason why I do this. I, I haven't explained it, but the reason why I do this. I, I may have explained it earlier. Because there's some people who have come to the church since that time. So I want them to have a basis of why, sort of where my mind is and, and how I think about things. And, and, and being as, as your, your under shepherd before the Lord, of, of what, how I think about things, how I look at things, and, and how I view the Word of God. And, and how I view Jesus Christ. And how we as a church should be. And also it's to, to refresh your memory. And guess what? It's also to refresh mine. So that's why we went through this. And again, I just want to give to help encourage you in your walk in relation to Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to close out just singing a song. We're going to sing an acapella this morning. The praise team will come up and help me they can. We're going to sing a song about the name of Jesus. It's just so called there's something about that. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs there is when you just begin to, to think about what it says. Because it truly is something about the name of Jesus. It's amazing. How as a believer, when we just begin to utter his name, let's be real, all of a sudden you start to feel as we put it, the Holy Ghost goosebumps. Right there? All of a sudden, you just begin to think about God, think about His goodness, begin to maybe sing a little song of praise, or just even begin to pray, or, or maybe something's word up, and all of a sudden it hits you like you do, but all of a sudden you begin to just, it, it's like electricity you feel come through your body, or, or all of a sudden you start to feel something shoot down your back. And again, it, it's not the scary, see, see this is different. How many of you have been in a situation where you know, like maybe maybe you're afraid of haunted house and you go in or you get in an eerie situation and you feel the eerie goosebumps? It's not those kind of goosebumps, is it? Yeah. It's the type of goosebumps like, whoa. You, you know you're in the presence of someone truly greater. You know yeah. that all of a sudden at that moment it seems like you have God's complete undivided attention. Oh, man. That's amazing when you utter the name of Jesus. I can feel it now. Can I just say that? How when you try to sing a song, all of a sudden your voice can't work anymore because it's not about you singing beautifully. It's about you worshiping the Lord who you're singing about. Let As a practice this morning, I, I made out through the song of the price when I, I cracked up several times because I was worshiping in practice. And, and when I do, my voice begins to crack and quiver and I just can't get my big mouth to operate the way I would like for it to operate. Because at that moment, it's not about me, it's about me just spending time in His presence. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. Let me take a sip of water so I have a little bit of gas. And we'll sing a song or something about that. Let me get into a little bit, everybody, and we can join in. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. He's my master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after And 